Today we're visiting Princeton University at Princeton, New Jersey. Princeton, of course, is one of the world's great universities, but it's also very important because it has the third largest university chapel in all the world. The other two, by the way, are at Valparaiso University in Indiana and King's Chapel at Cambridge in England. It's interesting how architecture can celebrate faith. And today we're going to look at the Princeton University Chapel and show you a sermon in stone. And here to help us understand the chapel is its dean, Ernest Gordon. Thanks very much for letting us come, Dean. Glad to see you. How old is this chapel? Well, it was, it'll be celebrating its 50th anniversary next year. And it was built between 25 and 28. And at what cost? Two million. You wouldn't be able to build it now for two million, would you? No, I shouldn't think so, not even for 25, 30 million. One of the reasons we come to look at the chapel is because its architecture says something about the faith of humankind. In the case of the Gothic church, often there was a cruciform, was there not, in the way it was built? Oh, indeed there was. And this was very characteristic of the French abbeys, particularly when the architects went out of the way to show that there was a bend in the line to indicate the position of Jesus' body on the cross. If someone were coming to Princeton for the first time and seeing this beautiful chapel, what particular things would you point out to them and ask them to look at? Well, first of all, I'd ask them to look at the tympanum. The tympanum tells the story of the exaltation of Jesus as the teacher of truth, the teacher of reality, the one who alone is worthy of opening the book of life, because that is exactly the quotation from Revelation. Now, once we go inside the narthex, what kind of effect has been created in the architecture? Well, the whole idea of the architect, and I think it's very successful, is to give one a sense of the vastness of the building and thus give one a sense of praise and glory and joy. Now, we also see some glorious windows in the chapel. I wonder if you could tell us about some of them. Well, the whole purpose of the windows is to reinforce the story of the architecture itself, which is to tell the story of Jesus. And so that you will begin at the west end, the north side, and read all the way round from left to right. I think one of the interesting aspects, though, of the window are those on the south side of the nave, which help to show the university life in, in, the, in the role of the chapel. Yes, the north side suggests action. The south side is the contemplative life, the life of reflection, of thought, that which is associated with philosophy, with law, with uh, theology, with literature. By the way, I think that one of the most important windows on the south side is the poetry window. It was executed by one of our own architects in this country, Mr. LeCompte, who is a splendid stained glass architect, probably one of the best, I think, not only in the country, but in the world. And there you see the relationship of Christian culture to contemporary thought, particularly in the field of literature and poetry. You start at the very top with King David, King David in his youthfulness. Then you have Martin Luther, George Herbert. Then in the first of the Lancet windows, you go back to the classical world, the classical world of Virgil. And Virgil is pointing to the holy child of his fourth eclogue. The second Lancet has uh, our friend Dante, and Dante is looking in the direction of the Holy Child because he is the one who introduced the understanding for the West that classical literature was initiated and inspired by the Holy Spirit. Then under Dante, we have Chaucer who introduced Dante to England, and you see Chaucer in pilgrimage to the great uh, cathedral in Canterbury. And in the very center, there's William Shakespeare. Under William Shakespeare, you have John Donne with his holy and with his uh, unholy uh, sonnet. Then you have John Milton, 
below John Milton, you have William Blake. And William Blake is sitting appropriately enough on the tiger, which also happens to be the Princeton tiger. The last two are Americans. Emily Dickinson in the upper corner of the Lancet window and T.S. Eliot on the lower part. It's part of a long tradition, is it not, Dean, that windows and architecture were to say something about the faith because many people were unable to read in the early days. It was. It was a dramatic presentation of the Christian faith in stone and in glass. Another dramatic aspect, I think, of the building is the beautiful carving. Where did the wood come from? That wood came from Sherwood Forest, and it must have been cut down a long time ago because there's very little left in the way of a forest in Nottingham. The pulpit comes from the north of France. It's very interesting that it comes from the 16th century and that it has survived as well as, as it has done. The left churn is very interesting as well because you have the great eagle over a serpent. Well, that's a symbolism of the victory of Jesus over Satan. There are some flags also, I notice, in one of the transepts. Yes, well, the, the first very ragged stars and stripes is the flag that flew over Congress during Woodrow Wilson's first two years as president. And the other two stars and stripes are those that were flown by the flag top Princeton and by the cruiser Princeton. And the other flag is the service flag of the university. The most glorious thing of all, though, to my way of thinking, are the great windows themselves. I wonder if you would explain their significance. The great east window is a beautiful blue and tells the story of Jesus' life of compassion. And it reminds us that the new commandment that he makes of us is the commandment that we love one another even as he has loved us. From there, uh, we move to the south window. The south window tells the story of truth. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And here the truth is presented in terms of the teachers of the truth. And you can see that in the window. Unfortunately, when you come to the Reformation period, the teachers of the truth are garbed in black, which makes the window indistinct. Then there's the great west window, which is a summing up of the whole iconography of the chapel itself. And it begins really with the exaltation of Jesus. So the same theme that you see in the tympanum is represented in the exaltation of Jesus surrounded by the medulla. Under him are the angels, glorifying and exalting him, singing the Te Deum Laudamus. And then you come down actually to the scenes of the nativity, to the reality, the historical reality of his incarnation. And then at the very bottom, I think it's very charming, the way the artist has depicted those who have been involved in the work of Christian art, such as the sculpture, such as the, as, as the glass blower, such as the musician, such as the architect. And again, the sense of the inspiration, the sense of revelation that comes through the angels is mediated through them. a great deal of pride and satisfaction to be the custodian of such a beautiful building. Oh, yes, it does. But above all, what is important is the people who come here, particularly our undergraduates. Thank you very much for letting us come here. Thank you. <laughs> Delighted to see you. And so the Princeton University Chapel says in stone, 
the truth that can be found in the Bible's book of Revelations. Behold, I have set before you an open door, and no man can shut it.